observed that he did not reach this high state all at one bound. He climbed, step by step perhaps, through many reincarnations. Keep this in mind and you will understand why you cannot reasonably expect infinite intelligence to circumvent the natural laws and turn man into the storehouse of all knowledge and all power until he has prepared himself to use this knowledge and power with higher than finite intelligence. If you want a fair example of what may happen to a man who suddenly comes into control of power, study some newly rich or someone who has inherited a fortune. Money power in the hands of John D. Rockefeller is not only in safe hands, but it is in hands where it is serving mankind throughout the world, blotting out ignorance, destroying contagious disease, and serving in a thousand other ways of which the average individual knows nothing. But place John D. Rockefeller's fortune in the hands of some young lad who has not yet finished high school, and you might have another story to tell, the details of which your own imagination and your knowledge of human nature will supply. I will have more to say on this subject in Lesson 14. If you have ever done any farming, you understand that certain preparations are necessary before a crop can be produced from the ground. You know, of course, that grain will not grow in the woods, that it requires sunshine and rain for its growth. Likewise, you understand that the farmer must plow the soil and properly plant the grain. After all this has been done, he then waits on nature to do her share of the work and she does it in due time without outside help. This is a perfect simile which illustrates the method through which one may attain the object of one's definite chief aim. First comes the preparation of the soil to receive the seed, which is represented by faith and infinite intelligence and understanding of the principle of autosuggestion and the subconscious mind through which the seed of a definite purpose may be planted. Then comes a period of waiting and working for the realization of the object of that purpose. During this period, there must be continuous intensified faith, which serves as the sunshine and the rain, without which the seed will wither and die in the ground. Then comes realization, harvest time, and a wonderful harvest can be brought forth. I am fully conscious of the fact that much of that which I am stating will not be understood by the beginner at the first reading for I have in mind my own experiences at the start. However, as the evolutionary process carries on its work, and it will do so, make no mistake about this, all the principles described in this and in all other lessons of this course will become as familiar to you as did the multiplication table after you had mastered it. And what is of greater importance still, these principles will work with the same unvarying certainty as does the principle of multiplication. Each lesson of this course has provided you with definite instructions to follow. The instructions have been simplified as far as possible so anyone can understand them. Nothing has been left to the student except to follow the instructions and supply the faith in their soundness without which they would be useless. In this lesson, you are dealing with four major factors to which I would again direct your attention with the request that you familiarize yourself with them. They are auto-suggestion, the subconscious mind, creative thought, and infinite intelligence. These are the four roadways over which you must travel in your upward climb in quest of knowledge. Observe that you control three of these. Observe also, and this is especially emphasized, that upon the manner in which you traverse these three roadways will depend the time and place at which they will converge into the fourth, or infinite intelligence. You understand what is meant by the terms autosuggestion and subconscious mind. Let us make sure that you understand also what is meant by the term creative thought. This means thought of a positive, non-destructive, creative nature. The object of Lesson 8 on self-control was to prepare you to understand and successfully apply the principle of creative thought. If you have not mastered that lesson, you are not ready to make use of creative thought in the attainment of your definite chief aim. Let me repeat a simile already used by saying that your subconscious mind is the field or the soil in which you sow the seed of your definite chief aim. Creative thought is the instrument with which you keep that soil fertilized and conditioned to awaken that seed into growth and maturity. Your subconscious mind will not germinate the seed of your definite chief aim, 
nor will infinite intelligence translate that purpose into physical reality. If you fill your mind with hatred and envy and jealousy and selfishness and greed, these negative or destructive thoughts are the weeds which will choke out the seed of your definite purpose. Creative thought presupposes that you will keep your mind in a state of expectancy of attainment of the object of your definite chief aim, that you will have full faith and confidence in its attainment in due course and in due order. If this lesson does that which it was intended to do, it will bring you a fuller and deeper realization of the third lesson of this course on self-confidence. As you begin to learn how to plant the seed of your desires in the fertile soil of your subconscious mind, and how to fertilize that seed until it springs into life and action, you will then have reason indeed to believe in yourself. And after you have reached this point in the process of your evolution, you will have sufficient knowledge of the real source from which you are drawing your power to give full credit to infinite intelligence for all that you had previously credited to your self-confidence. Any man may become great by doing the commonplace things of life in a great spirit, with a genuine desire to be of helpful service to others, regardless of his calling. Salesmanship consists very largely in knowing and in showing the prospective buyer the real merits of the goods or service you are trying to sell. Remember that your real wealth can be measured not by what you have, but by what you are. Autosuggestion is a powerful weapon with which one may rise to heights of great achievement when it is used constructively. Used in a negative manner, however, it may destroy all possibility of success, and if so used continuously, it will actually destroy health. Careful comparison of the experiences of leading physicians and psychiatrists disclosed the startling information that approximately 75% of those who are ill are suffering from hypochondria, which is a morbid state of mind causing useless anxiety about one's health. Stated in plain language, the hypochondriac is a person who believes he or she is suffering with some sort of imaginary disease, and often these unfortunates believe they have every disease of which they ever heard the name. Hypochondriacal conditions are generally superinduced by auto-intoxication, or poisoning through failure of the intestinal system to throw off the waste matter. The person who suffers with such a toxic condition is not only unable to think with accuracy, but suffers from all sorts of perverted, destructive, illusory thoughts. Many sick people have tonsils removed, or teeth pulled, or the appendix taken out, when their trouble could have been removed with an internal bath and a bottle of citrate of magnesia, with due apologies to my friends the physicians, one of the leading of whom gave me this information. Hypochondria is the beginning of most cases of insanity. Dr. Henry R. Rose is authority for the following typical example of the power of autosuggestion. If my wife dies, I will not believe there is a God. His wife was ill with pneumonia, and this is the way he greeted me when I reached his home. She had sent for me because the doctor had told her she could not recover. Most doctors know better than to make a statement such as this in the presence of a patient. She had called her husband and two sons to her bedside and bidden them goodbye. She then asked that I, her minister, be sent for. I found the husband in the front room sobbing and the sons doing their best to brace her up. When I went into her room she was breathing with difficulty, and the trained nurse told me she was very low. I soon found that Mrs. N. had sent for me to look after her two sons after she was gone. Then I said to her, You mustn't give up. You are not going to die. You have always been a strong and healthy woman, and I do not believe God wants you to die and leave your boys to me or anyone else. I talked to her along this line and then read the 103rd Psalm and made a prayer in which I prepared her to get well rather than to enter eternity. I told her to put her faith in God and throw her mind and will against every thought of dying. Then I left her, saying, I will come again after the church service, and I will then find you much better. This was on Sunday morning. I called that afternoon. Her husband met me with a smile. He said that the moment I had gone, his wife called him and the boys into the room and said, Dr. Rose says that I am not going to die, that I am going to get well, and I am. She did get well, but what did it? 
two things, auto suggestion superinduced by the suggestion I had given her, and faith on her part. I came just in the nick of time, and so great was her faith in me that I was able to inspire faith in herself. It was that faith that tipped the scales and brought her through the pneumonia. No medicine can cure pneumonia. The physicians admit that. There are cases of pneumonia, perhaps, that nothing can cure. We all sadly agree to that, but there are times, as in this case, when the mind, if worked upon and worked with in just the right way, will turn the tide. While there is life, there is hope. But hope must rule supreme and do the good that hope was intended to do. Here is another remarkable case showing the power of the human mind when used constructively. A physician asked me to see Mrs. H. He said there was nothing organically wrong with her, but she just wouldn't eat. Having made up her mind that she could not retain anything on her stomach, she had quit eating and was slowly starving herself to death. I went to see her and found first that she had no religious belief. She had lost her faith in God. I also found that she had no confidence in her power to retain food. My first effort was to restore her faith in the Almighty and to get her to believe that He was with her and would give her power. Then I told her that she could eat anything she wanted. True, her confidence in me was great, and my statement impressed her. She began to eat from that day. She was out of her bed in three days for the first time in weeks. She is a normal, healthy, and happy woman today. What did it? The same forces as those described in the preceding case. Outside suggestion, which she accepted in faith and applied through self-suggestion, and inward confidence. There are times when the mind is sick and it makes the body sick. At such times it needs a stronger mind to heal it by giving it direction, and especially by giving it confidence and faith in itself. This is called suggestion. It is transmitting your confidence and power to another, and with such force as to make the other believe as you wish and do as you will. It need not be hypnotism. You can get wonderful results with the patient wide awake and perfectly rational. The patient must believe in you, and you must understand the workings of the human mind in order to meet the arguments and questions of the patient. Each one of us can be a healer of this sort and thus help our fellow men. It is the duty of every person to read some of the best books on the forces of the human mind and learn what amazing things the mind can do to keep people well and happy. We see the terrible things that wrong thinking does to people, even going to such lengths as to make them positively insane. It is high time we found out the good things the mind can do, not only to cure mental disorders, but physical diseases as well. You should delve deeper into this subject. I do not say the mind can cure everything. There is no reliable evidence that certain forms of cancer have been cured by thinking or faith or any mental or religious process. If you would be cured of cancer, you must take it at the very beginning and treat it surgically. There is no other way, and it would be criminal to suggest that there is. But the mind can do much with so many types of human indisposition and disease that we ought to rely upon it more often than we do.